Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to the second part of our now annual feature for the food and drink sector in collaboration with the Food and Drink Exporters Association and the Food and Drink Federation. Today's webinar is on how to approach export documentation within the sector, and hopefully it will be useful for businesses from other sectors too. My name is William Barnes-Graham, and I am the Digital Content Manager at open to export we are a government-supported online community helping small UK businesses get ready to sell overseas through our step-by-step -step guides, articles, regular webinars, Ask the Experts forum and our Export Action Plan tool. You can find all of these on our website at www.opentexport.com. You can ask questions at any point during this webinar using the question box on the control panel to the right-hand side of your screen. We will get to as many of these as we can at the end. And with the questions, we will be reposting these onto the forum following the webinar. We will then reassign these questions to your user account should you be registered to our site. This will allow you to get answers straight to your email inbox within a week or so. We don't typically share the slides from the presentation, but we will be recording today's session and sending you a copy of it by the end of the week, as well as uploading it to our website where you can view this and all of our previous webinars on demand as many times as you like. We have two great speakers today. We'll have Richard Collins from Manson International, one of Britain's largest food and drink exporters with a massive range of food and drink products. Richard will share some of his experiences and top tips, which will be fascinating, I'm sure. He'll be joined later on by Ian Barker, Ramson's International Compliance Manager, who will be helping with the questions. Before Richard, we'll have Lorraine Holt from Whole Chambers of Commerce, who will be giving an introduction and overview of some of the key documents involved in exporting. So to begin with, over to you, Lorraine. Hey, thank you, William. Um, so yes, my name's Lorraine Holt. I've been at the Hull and Humber Chamber of Commerce for 11 years in the International Trade Department. Uh, we work with a lot of companies exporting a variety of products overseas. Uh, for example, we have a lot of food and drink exporters, chemicals, ball bearings, machinery, pharmaceutical products, and even live pigs. Um, next slide, please, Will. So the Hull and Humber Chamber of Commerce were one of the oldest in the UK. We were formed in 1837. We represent all types of businesses in the Humber region, which covers Hull and East Riding of Yorkshire and North and North East Lincolnshire. I'm actually in the International Trade Department, and our aim is to help companies with error-free exporting, improve customer service, and the prompt receipt of payments. Next slide, please. Uh, do you find the pile of export documents daunting? not sure how to approach export documentation. Uh, some of the reasons that people put off exporting perhaps and don't get on with export documentation is the paperwork is unfamiliar to them and they're not used to handling paperwork. Some people, their job is to sell products, not to actually get them to the country. Okay, um, next slide please. If you get your documents wrong, these are some of the things that could happen and your shipment could be delayed at the overseas customs, which incur additional charges. Uh, the shipment can be returned to you, again, incurring additional charges. Your shipment could be destroyed, um, a loss of customers, uh, damage to your reputation on, a, on an international scale. Uh, in our experience, we've had quite a few companies where the first, uh, our first introduction to them, they've rang the chamber and has said, help, my shipment's got stuck um, in customs overseas, what do I do now? So then we come in and we advise them what they need to do. Okay, next slide, please. The advice that we always give our customers, um, our exporters, when looking at overseas markets, you need to ask your customer, what do they need from you to import your products into their market? They're, they are in the best place to find out what documents are needed. Uh, they have access to their customs. Um, so they are the best people to ask what is needed to import your product, the product they are buying from you into their country. Contact your chamber. Uh, we've got all sorts of resources, knowledge, and contacts available. And also do your homework. That's very important. Next slide, please. Just a bit of general information on the purpose of export documents. Um, they're not there just to make your, your life a headache. Um, they, they've got a legal purpose, customs declarations, certain markets um, control what 
products are allowed into those markets and we control what products are allowed out of our market. Overseas customs requirements and payment of import duties. They've got a, a commercial purpose. They need to identify the goods, what goods are being shipped and where, the, where are they being shipped to and the documents you want to get paid. And you can also zero rate, and that zero rate your invoice when exporting. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the export documents that are required do vary according to the product you're exporting and the market you're exporting to. Um, the minimum documents required are a commercial invoice, um, and a bill of lading, or an airway bill, the shipping document. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of a commercial invoice or an export invoice. It's a CIPRO layout, which is an internationally recognized layout for an invoice. So the position of the boxes on the form can be located, even if the person overseas is reading them cannot actually understand what's in them. Um, they can easily recognize what the information should be by where the box is. The export invoice is different to a commercial invoice, <coughs> excuse me, in that it includes additional details such as tariff codes, which are used to calculate export and import duties and taxes, an inca term, uh, which is terms of sale and delivery, and also option, which is optional bank details to enable you to receive payment. For certain markets, your export invoice needs to have special clauses, particularly with Arab markets. And some markets may also require your invoice to be translated and also legalized. Next slide, please. The bill of lading, so this is issued by shipping companies for the movement of goods by sea. Um, the marine bill of lading is the only transport document that is a proof of title of the goods. <coughs> Next slide, please. The airway bill um, issued for consignments transported by air. So again, a receipt for goods and evidence of a contract of carriage. Next slide, please. Other documents that you may be asked for, which the Chambers of Commerce are heavily involved with. So we've got a packing list, certificate of origin, um, an EUR1 and an ATR. An ATR is not actually applicable to the food and drink industry, but I've included this for information purposes. Next slide, please. Uh, packing list. Again, this is a CIPRO layout. It's not always required, but it's useful to detail how your shipment has been packed and to show weights and dimensions. Next slide, please. OK, a certificate of origin. This is a document that only Chambers of Commerce can certify. Um, it's something that we see a lot of at the Hull and Humber Chamber of Commerce. It is actually a certificate of non-originating origin. So it's not a preference document, which I'll talk about later. It's a certificate of non-originating origin. Like I said, only Chambers of Commerce can certify these docu documents. They're an, in an important international trade document that attests that goods in a particular export shipment are wholly obtained, produced, manufactured, or processed in a particular country. From the Chamber perspective, uh, although the document looks relatively simple there, and it is quite easy to fill out, we do see a lot of incorrectly filled in documents, which means that um, you will incur additional costs and delays because we cannot certify an incorrect document, so we will send it back to you. What we've also found is this certificate is a small part of the, the, the compliance documents that the exporter completes, part of the whole shipping process, the whole export process. It's just a small part for them, so you perhaps don't allocate it the importance it deserves, but it is a very important document. And like I said, if you get it wrong, you will incur delays and additional costs. Um, yes, they are easy documents to fill in, despite what you may think when you first see one. If you do have any problems, just ask your chamber. The chambers are always there to help. Uh, another way, uh, well, something else about these documents, all chambers offer electronic export documentation services. Uh, the, these electronic services save exporters time and money. All of the Hull and Humber Chamber of Commerce um, documentation customers, we use a system called EasyCert, and all of our customers prefer this system to trying to complete these documents manually. It saves them time. 
because um, their details are all automatically imported into the system. They can copy previous applications. Um, if you're new to completing these documents, the, the systems, they tell you what the boxes are, what you need to put in the boxes. Uh, there's, as you can see on the left hand side, there's a tick system. If you, if you haven't completed a certain box, there'll be a cross there. It really is very simple and we've helped design these systems. The chambers have been crucial in helping design these systems to make them easy for exporters. And also with electronic systems, another way of saving time is you, have to, you can apply for three documents at the same time, three export documents at the same time, but only have to input the information once. For example, you can apply for a certificate of origin, as I've shown the example there, a commercial invoice, and an EUR1. And all you have to do is input the information once, and you've got three export documents there. That's a major time saver. Next slide, please. Uh, when you are exporting, the most common certificate of origin is a European Community Certificate of Origin. If you are exporting to an Arab country, you should use an Arab Certificate of Origin. You need to be very careful when exporting to Arab countries. If your customer has asked you for an EC certificate of origin, you should be using an Arab. Um, I have got a list of the Arab countries after this slide. If in doubt, always use an Arab certificate for an Arab country. Uh, with Arab certificates of origin and also Arab invoices, you may be asked for a legalised document. So again, go to your chamber and we will arrange the legalisation. Some countries require this document to be translated. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the list of Arab League states, the Arab countries that you must use Arab documents for. The only country I'd like to draw your attention to is Egypt, which although it's an Arab League state, you would use an e a European Community Certificate of Origin for Egypt. Next slide, please. And EUR1, this is another important document, it's a preference document. Um, as we are at the moment, the UK is still part of the EU. The EU has trade agreements in place with various countries and overseas territories where originating products can be imported into the overseas country or territory under a nil or lower rate of duty, making your product, your UK product, more attractive to your overseas customer than perhaps the same product from a competitor in, in the United States of America, for example. Chains of Commerce again can certify these documents. When applying for an EUR1 or using an EUR, your goods have to be leaving from the UK. Again, you can apply for these electronically. Next slide, please. So like I said, the, these are preference documents which get your products into the overseas country under a nil or lower rate of duty. They are not to be used for goods in free circulation. Just because goods are in free circulation does not mean they satisfy the origin rules. If you want to know more about preference and origin rules, um, Customs Notices 827, it's about procedures 828, 830 and 832. They're the ones that you need to look at. In some cases, if your invoice value is below a certain amount, you can use a declaration on your invoice rather than a rather than a new R1 form, or if your company is looking to be an authorised economic operator, then you can use declarations then as well. Next slide, please. Um, an ATR. So you probably won't be using this document, but I've, I've included it just for information purposes. And um, this is the preferential document for imports and exports between the EU and Turkey. It's mostly used for industrial products, and the customs notice for this one is 812. Next slide, please. So, uh, food and drink products. Documents are specific to the food and drink industry and the products you may be exporting. And things that you need to consider. Um, product registration with the authorities of the import country. Labelling of the product, um, ingredients, some markets require you to have the, the labels in their, in their language. Certificate of analysis, method of analysis, good manufacturing practice certificate, a health certificate, a certificate of free sale, a phytosanitary certificate, UK export license, buyer's import license. Next slide, please. Importing country requirements. You can't assume because you're 
export into one country and you get an order from a different country that they will require the same documents and compliance as the country you're currently exporting to. All countries are different and vary according to the products you're exporting. So their products must comply with the local or food additives. Um, certain markets ban or restrict certain products. Uh, you can find out more information about banned and restricted products if you look at the market access database. The EU market access database will give you that sort of information. Um, you need an awareness of legalisation concerning the import of high risk classified products. You need to familiarise yourself with the rules of the country importing the food or drink that you're exporting. Like I said, the regulations vary according to the country and the product you're sending there. Next slide, please. I've just included um, an example of exporting a food product overseas. The markets I've chosen are South Africa because the EU has a trade agreement in place with South Africa, Saudi Arabia as an Arab country, and China just as a big market. So I got this information from, again, the market access database where you, you will need your, the tariff number for your product. The import duty on exporting croutons to South Africa from the UK because of the EU trade agreement is not percent import duty. So depending on your invoice value, you can either put an invoice declaration or apply for an EUR1 and your goods will get into South Africa under a not percent rate of import duty. Without that document, you would have to pay your, well, your customer would have to pay 21% import duty. Saudi Arabia is 5% no matter where the goods are coming from. And China, MFN stands for Most Favoured Nation, which tends to be World Trade Organization members. So from the UK, 20% import duty. The export documents required for sending croutons into these overseas markets, as you can see, there's the same basic three for each mark, four for each market. Uh, and then they vary. So we've got commercial invoice, packing list, pro forma invoice, certificate of non-preferential origin, which is a certificate of origin, proof of preferential origin, which is your EUR1 or your invoice declaration, your, your airway bill or your bill of lading. And the last one for South Africa is actually the requirement of the import, a registration with the South African Revenue Service. So that's another thing to consider, as well as having your export documents in place and complying with those requirements, your importer must also comply with their, their country requirements. So South Africa importers must be registered with SARS. Um, and in China on here, your importer must um, have customs registration and an import-export business license in place. Next slide, please. Okay, the export of alcohol. Uh, these are just some of the aspects you need to consider when exporting alcohol overseas. Do you need an export license? Will the buyer need an import license? Is the buyer approved as a registered consignee and licensed importer? Uh, will the buyer use the services of an authorised warehouse operator? Uh, you need to be aware that an export refund scheme may be available. For example, in the manufacture of whisky, imported cereals may be eligible for processing relief. If, if the exporter produces spirits, the duty is usually payable once the goods have left the exporter's premises. However, I'm going to be talking after this slide about the EMCS system where this will be discussed a little further. Samples of products uh, will, probably be, will probably be required for product registration. There may be the possibility of varying import certificates for wine compared with beers. And again, check the taxes, duties and registration of the importing country. Next slide, please. So the EMCS system is the Excise Movement and Control System. This system exists to simplify procedures for traders with a standardised electronic system for the whole of the EU. It records in real time the movement of alcohol, tobacco and energy products for which excise duties are still to be paid. It can be the movement of goods between UK warehouses or between UK and EU warehouses or UK to non-EU shipments where a UK or European port of exit is used. The liability for duty is released when the goods are received at the destination warehouse or the associated export declaration is departed. Um, the EMCS system speeds up the release of guarantees when goods arrive at the destination. Next slide, please. Um, 
this document, the electronic administrative document, if you dispatch duty suspended excise goods using the EMCS system, as the comes now, you will need to complete this EAD document, the electronic, the electronic administrative document um, through EMCS before the movement takes place. Um, this draft shows you the type of information that HMRC receive when a, when a request to move excise goods is, is submitted. Although there's lots of boxes, not all of the fields are mandatory. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a flow chart on how to use the EMCS. Again, movements can be between UK warehouses, UK and European warehouses, or UK to non-EU shipments where a UK or European port of exit is used. And again, this can actually be applied for or completed through the Chamber's electronic documentation systems. Next slide, please. So I'm coming to an end now. Uh, why is it important for you to have a good relationship with your Chamber or to be in touch with the Chamber? Uh, we provide advice on what documents and special clauses may be required for specific countries. We, we can advise you, give you advice on how to complete documents and who to go to and where to get particular documents from. The Chamber doesn't deal in all export documents, but we, we know who does, so we can, we can point you in the right direction. We also offer training courses on export documentation and procedures. We provide bespoke in-house training on whatever your export needs are. We've got electronic systems in place to make export documentation easier, faster and cheaper. We also have seminars and one-to-ones, regular seminars and one-to-ones with experts from overseas. We've got a global network of experts overseas, global network of chambers. Uh, for example, today we've actually got the British Chamber of Commerce from South Africa here meeting with our local exporters to advise on what documents they may need to export their product into the South African market. Uh, and that's me done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, really great to, to see some examples of the documents and just to give that, that overview, um, A, of how to approach documentation and B, of the Chamber support. So thank you very much. And um, now to give a, um, a kind of overview of an actual exporter's experience doing all of this, uh, over to you, Richard. Thank you, Will. Good morning, everybody. My name is Richard Collins. I'm the Trading Director for Runs International. Um, before we get into the nuts and bolts of the documentation, I'll just give you a, a quick overview of Ramsden's and who we are and where we operate. Next slide, please, Will. Ramsden's is a family business. Uh, we started in exporting um, British food more than 40 years ago. The business started with a, a grocery store here in Grimsby, um, and that grocery store was opened by the father of W. Ramsden, who he himself became the founder of NICER, National Independent Supermarket Association, which is today a £1.3 billion turnover company for Amazon. Um, we operate in all the key export markets, as you would expect, Spain, France, Portugal, Germany, um, the Middle East, lots of business in the Middle East, and Southeast Asia is also booming for us. Um, we have customers in the Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, and also Canada, and we've also got offices in Dubai, Bangkok, Johannesburg, Sydney, and Hong Kong, and we're due to open Toronto and Miami very shortly. So we're, we're very experienced in the exporting of British food and drink products. Next slide, please, Will. We live or are based in Grimsby. It's not just all about fish, but we have um, a, a self-confined um, office accommodation here in Grimsby, and this is the hub of the business, really. Um, we uh, employ 85 people and uh, have over 550 customers in 124 countries. Next slide, please. Well, we're supplying retailers, both large and small, so it could be the mom and pop uh, retailers in Spain and Portugal, or it could be large multinational retailers, such as Carrefour, Giant, Ocean, um, in some of the larger uh, countries of the world. And next slide, please. 
And also we have relationships with wholesalers and food service suppliers in some countries as well, um, because very often a, you can't trade direct with the retailer themselves. They prefer to go to, through a distribution channel, so it's important that we um, don't alienate ourselves to those operators. Next slide, please. Uh, we pride ourselves on the service that we deliver and um, the, 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 the strength of the business is really about the people within the business and our ability to understand very quickly uh, the requirements of um, core markets and indeed new markets. We've won the Queen's Award for Industry uh, on three occasions. Um, as you can see on the screen then, you, we're very, very um, pleased with, with how we get um, recognition. Um, I think with the last count we've had 87 awards in the last 15 years, so we're very, very pleased um, that um, the work we do is uh, recognized by industry. Next slide. Um, our main supplier of the goods is NYSA. They're based in Scunthorpe. They supply about 90% of our products. Um, we're their number two member of that £1.3 billion pound business and we are experts, we do consider our experts in sourcing, handling, reprocessing and delivering grocery products worldwide. Our uh, product range goes up out to 23,000 individual SKUs so there's lots, lots of choice for our customers and the key thing for us is we don't hold stock, it's a stockless model as we get customer orders in then we lay those orders off to the suppliers. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned we've got 85 people in the business. That includes um, individuals, very skilled individuals within our customer services team. Um, it's multilingual. It's very important that we speak the language of our customers because then we can truly satisfy their needs. So we speak 14 different languages. We have two people, as an example, that speak Mandarin, Hungarian, Czechoslovakian, um, Arabic, you name it, we, I don't think it's a language that we really can't um, get to um, within our customer service team. Next slide. And we do offer comprehensive support. So um, give you an example, we offer translation services, relabeling services, and injecting services. I, I remember um, when I first joined the business about 19 months ago, we were actually stripping down within our reprocessing warehouse 27 pallets of Easter eggs. Every single egg had to be relabeled with the requirements of the destination country, which in this in instance was Australia. We shrink wrapped, repalletized within 24 hours to get the flight from Heathrow on the Saturday. So we're very, very skilled. We have a great team of people at our reprocessing warehouse and uh, you know, we have a reputation for delivering a very, very good service. Next slide, please. So our objectives in terms of compliance, that's just an overview of the business, just to set the scene, but clearly it is getting more and more complex. It's not just about buying stock, shipping stock, and providing the documents that go with it. Every country um, that we deal with, except outside the EU, I suppose, is getting more and more um, difficult to, to gain entry. Uh, China is an example, is a particular pressure point, as indeed is Australia and New Zealand. But we decided to develop our own in-house expertise in export compliance to give us really a significant USP in the export marketplace. Uh, we wanted to be seen as the experts in our field by our customers. Um, we, in order to do that, we needed to develop robust relationships with suppliers and brand owners um, because they themselves have product compliance support that they can offer. In the main, we get good support from those brand owners and suppliers, um, and that really helps streamline our ability to satisfy the needs of our customers. And it, it allows us, by having this team, allows us to open up um, new business opportunities in what can be described as difficult markets. Um, Long in this webinar with me, as uh, Will mentioned, is Ian Barker, our uh, compliance manager, and we also have a team of six people within our product data team who manage all of our translations and compliance needs for all our customers. Next slide, please. Um, 
We wanted to be more proactive and anticipate market requirements. It's speed is really, really important in this business, so we wanted to improve our reaction time to compliance requests. As I mentioned earlier, um, develop our expertise to give access to difficult but potentially lucrative markets. And Egypt is a good example. Rain touched on that uh, in her presentation, but I'll, at the end of the presentation, I'll give you a good example on Egypt. And we wanted to be able to have a uh, be able to centralise and share the information. So basically, we have a really good central database that our customer service people and indeed our salespeople can dip in and dip out of. Next slide, please. Um, it's in valuable to get the, what we call the knowledge. You know, we don't drive London cabs, but it is very important that we um, have the right level of experience and the knowledge. So, you know, building close relationships with industry body, bodies is hugely important. Organisations such as the FDF, the FDEA, and the UKTI are, are vital in, in working through this net, um, sector. Again, develop a network of contacts with brand owners and manufacturers. Um, we have really, really good relationships with a lot of the brand owners and manufacturers. Some are a little bit um, less easy to deal with, where, particularly where they've got their own export uh, division. But generally, I would say we have a very good relationship with them. It's really important to employ dedicated re resource. Be serious about um, exporting. Don't underplay the requirements of compliance. As I mentioned, we've got a team of seven people now really focused on, on um, the compliance aspects of our business. Make sure you budget um, for compliance and product testing. There's lots of tests that you need to, to do, such as trans fat analysis, etc. And very rarely do you get it for free. So you need to have a good, strong budget in there to ensure you can actually deliver the promises you're making to customers. As I mentioned, build a database for the future, and also, as um, very well demonstrated by Lorraine, work extremely closely with your local councils and chambers of commerce. You know, uh, Holland Humber are a, a vital ingredient to our knowledge and the support that they give us. Next slide, please. This, this chart here really just shows the information flow that we need to understand for each market. So this particular region is Oceania, um, the country is Australia, and some of the types of documentation that we require to enter Australia with goods are shown there. So it's manufacturer declarations, our own in-house product declarations if we cannot get them from suppliers, the manufacturer's uh, specification sheets, so every product will have a spec sheet, and we generally need to have those for every product that we ship and also letters of acknowledgement. Because we don't manufacture goods, in some markets you have to have a letter of acknowledgement from the supplier or brand owner to um, allow you to ship those goods into the country. Next slide, please. And this is it's a little bit small to see, but I wanted to demonstrate here the types of examples of different food products and the um, declarations and, and documents that are required. So for all food products in Australia, you need the invoice. It has to go onto treated pallets. All the goods have to be uh, on treated pallets and must include a container cleanliness statement. You need declamate on the declaration. You need to quote the vessel name, the container number and seal, the quarantine entry number, a full ingredient listing, and where possible percentages, although you know we do have a battle with getting percentages to do this effectively, the supplier and the brand owner giving away their recipes of the product. And also a statement that the product conforms to all uh, relevant EU food regulations and is fit for human consumption. I'll not we'll go through the other four lines there, but you can see for different types of products you need different uh, declarations and documentation. So if I picked on the ambrosia custard and rice pudding, it has to be go through a thermal process. You have to have a statement to say all dairy ingredients are UK bovine origin with the milk having undergone a pasteurization pre-treatment at 72 and a half degrees for 15 seconds. So you can see a lot of complexity even down to a skew level. 
Next slide, please. And I'm not going to dwell through these. These are just some examples of the declarations of the documents that we need. There's one from Premier, Premier Foods in terms of their Ambrosia products. Next slide, please. This is an in-house declaration where if we cannot obtain the information from the supplier, we can take the product, we can extract the information we need, and we um, can sign and seal a declaration, and generally that, that um, will work instead of the manufacturer declaration. Next slide, please. This is an export health certificate. So this is a shipment that we made to Jordan. Um, we're there as the exporter, and the products that we exported on that shipment are clearly shown there and in terms of who the brand owner is. So every single manufacturer of the products that we have shipped on this shipment have to be noted on the export health certificate. Next slide please. This is a food safety certificate. So some countries require that even the factory where the product is produced comes with a food safety certificate. So you can see we're, we're talking here about a Nestle factory near Newcastle upon Tyne. So again, the level of detail can be quite complex. Next slide, please. And this is the product specification storage and usage declarations that very often we have to supply for each single SKU. We're fortunate that we can hold these on file and this is where the database comes in because in, in the main, we uh, have a lot of these um, declarations and documents at our fingertips. Clearly what we have to be mindful of is if the ingredients change or the products become dis discontinued, that database has to be fully updated. Next slide, please. And it, uh, Lorraine touched on this. This is the EUR one. Most of these are generated uh, electronically. Um, this particular one was for Jordan, and if we hadn't supplied the EUR one for that customer, he would have been faced with 80% local tax on the import, rather than the 20% that the EUR one certificate allows him to, to pay. So you can see it's a very, very um, important document um, when shipping. Next slide, please. Lorraine, uh, Lorraine touched on this again. This is the easy cert. We have this system in our office. All our customer service um, assistants have access to the system. Um, and that allows us to process a lot of the documents and obtain a lot of the documents that we need for each country and region um, electronically and online. Next slide, please. And just to demonstrate that, this is a, the next screen within the easy cert um, system. Destination country, as an example, is Jordan, and it identifies um, the documents that we will have to provide um, for that destination country. And we just complete the documents and send with the shipment or send ahead of the shipment. Next slide, please. And this is um, a manufacturer's letter of authority. Um, we were faced, and I'll, I'll come on to it, in Egypt as an example, um, where they changed their import regulations and legislation last December, almost overnight. Uh, the Egyptian economy is, is spiraling out of control. And in order to help promote sale of locally produced products, their um, requirement for importing um, UK products as an example, tightened and in order to get branded products in it's extremely difficult um, where if you have a letter of authority from a supplier we can act as their agent so effectively we've got the same credentials as the supplier and the producer. So this was a letter from one of our suppliers to allow us to ship their range of branded products into the Egyptian market. Next slide please. Um, this is um, the GSO regulations in, in the Middle East. Um, basically, you'll be aware that the Middle East is made up of a number of emirates. And typically, their requirements for shelf life is no more than 24 months and no less than six months. So every product and every order that we process, we need to make sure that the goods we're shipping conform to those um, shelf life rules. But in Qatar, which is one of the Emirates, it's totally different. 
For that emirate, they require the shelf life to be designated by product category. So you can see an example there, can meet. The expiration period can be 24 months. Um, whereas you go down to whole egg powder, it can go down to 12 months. So every order that we process for, the, uh, for Qatar could take up to three months to actually get it ordered and then shipped because we have to go through so much backwards and forwards with uh, the customer to make sure the goods were shipping and satisfy the expiration periods by category. And to make it even more difficult, the categories are not aligned to the normal category structure that we have here in the UK. So there's a little bit of um, manual intervention required, to say the least, in order to get goods into Qatar. Next slide, please. I mentioned that we do labelling, and this is just a good example, so it's not all about documentation, but if you want to ship goods to the USA, not only have you got the FDA regulations to contend with, but you also need to make sure that your labels comply without question to the example I'm showing on the screen now, both in terms of the font, the font size, um, the, the, the depth and width of the, the lines on anything, and in the, the structure. It all has to be uniform, as you can see there. If there's anything um, untoward with that label, um, then the goods could be impounded in the USA. You won't see them again, and all you've done is probably cost yourself something like thirty to forty thousand pounds on the shipment of the container. So very, very tight controls are required. And you understand it's even further complexity for us. Next slide, please. This is the the, the final one um, of, of my presentation, really. And I, I said, don't be afraid to seek help and advice from your customers. Um, if we take that example I gave of Egypt, where um, the import regulations changed overnight, we have not shipped anything to Egypt since December, but thankfully we managed to ship two containers last month. And that was on the back of working with a very, very good distribution partner. We flew him over here um, about six weeks ago. He spent five days with us. He oversaw the handling of his orders, both in terms of the label quality, the translations that we've done, the way we packed it, the way we shipped it, and I'm pleased to say those two containers went through customs without a ha any hassle whatsoever. So he's been a great piece of resource for us. It wasn't us saying, sorry, we can't do it for you. It was us admitting we didn't really fully understand the, the re um, regulations until that point and he came over and he gave us much valued um, information on what we need to do. So that has now actually opened up a very lucrative market for us because we're far better equipped to service it and get goods through um, the customs for us. And that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. It's really great to get some real practical tips and um, just, just to hear from your experiences uh, going through the process of actually getting export documentation correct. A lot was covered in both presentations and we've had a few questions in, um, so we're, we're going to open the, the floor to them now. Remember, you can ask questions using the control panel on the right-hand side and we'll try to get to as many of these as we can over the next few minutes. Um, we've had a couple of questions about translation um, from Matthew. Um, the questions he's, he's asking is, do you need to translate documentation into the country's language that you are selling into, and how important is good or correct translation, and who should be responsible for this? So I'm going to hand that over to, to Richard and Ian to begin with. Yep, well, it, it's very important to uh, translate the documentation into the uh, language of the destination country. There are some where you can use English if it's an English-speaking nation, but generally you do have to translate, and the translation has to be very, very accurate indeed, because if it gets to customs and the translations are incorrect on any documentation or indeed on the labels that are on the products, the um, shipment can be um, impounded and um, even destroyed. And uh, is, the, is the responsibility for that translation usually on behalf of the, the seller or can it sometimes be of a distributor? Well, we, we typically always get a, 
we, we will do our own um, in-house translations. For example, we've got a, a, an Arabic translator in our public data team. So we will do the translations ourselves and then send them to the customer for confirmation and ensure that he, he or she is happy with the work that we've done. Thank you, Richard. Um, second question, and I, I guess this might be for, for Lorraine and Richard might be able to help as well. It's a question about sanctions. How, how do you find out if a sanction is in place for a country that could stop you exporting there? And kind of um, what advice would you give to someone who's facing that? Lorraine? Uh, well, if unsure, um, contact your chamber. Uh, we would check with our contacts probably uh, the export licensing department and also on a specific country web pages as well and with the embassies. So if in doubt, contact the chamber. Thank you. Um, always, always good advice that um, if in doubt, yeah, contact people who who will know. And um, I guess yeah. the the next question is is comes off the licensing point, and it's are food and drink exports ever subject to export controls? For example, possible military applications of of uh, ingredients within them. Uh, is that one for you, Lorraine? I haven't actually seen many shipments where uh, food has been involved in the military controls but um, if if somebody asks us and we will probably contact the the export control department and just get some more information about it I myself I don't know Richard might know more than I do uh, no, but we would contact sorry Lorraine. no we, we, we've not experienced that um, but referencing the previous question we have a, a simple system that we call our band checker so as we take orders in from customers, we run those um, that order through the band checker, and that will highlight to us any potential uh, contraventions as to what can be imported into certain countries. If you take the Middle East, it will always throw out products that have got pork and beef gelatin in them, as an example, and that means that we can't ship that product. So we advise the customer accordingly. So we do have a, a fairly efficient system with our band checker and uh, it prevents a lot of problems in terms of wrong shipping products. Thank you both, and that's a really good example of the end about gelatin and um, kind of the Middle East. Um, and another question we've had in is, um, it's the standard Brexit question in a sense, it's how big a challenge could a loss of access to the EU single market be in terms of additional paperwork? And uh, I think I know what you're going to say, Lorraine, but um, do, you want, do you want to handle that quickly? Um, yeah, well, we were discussing this earlier, weren't we, Will? Um, we, we don't know what the effect is going to be yet. Uh, obviously, all the paperwork will change, particularly with the trade agreements. Uh, we're hoping that our politicians will negotiate the tr trade agreements. Um, so we will have new paperwork in the future, but at the moment, we're just continuing as we always have done with the UK being still a member of the EU. Thank you. And, and Richard, from your experience, is this something you're preparing for, the, the potential additional kind of work which might go, go into exporting because of the uh, change of the relationship, or is it just something you're business as usual and not looking into it yet? Yeah, it, it's very much business as usual. Um, clearly, it's difficult to prepare for something that you don't know what's going to change. As Lorraine says, you know, you, we don't know what the documentation is going to uh, entail, so it's difficult to prepare. But, you know, we're, we're, we're fairly fleet of foot and we'll, we'll take what's thrown at us. I think the important thing to remember, though, is that the majority of the other EU member states um, export more into the UK than we do to them. Um, so there has got to be some uh, level of free trade agreements, which uh, potentially might even mean that uh, some of the documents don't have necessarily have to change too much, because clearly it would be you know, remiss of them really, I would think, that uh, they could deny themselves if, they, if it became too complex. Um, you know, we're a very lucrative market for some of their products that they're exporting into the UK. Thank you, Richard and Lorraine. Um, we've got a few more minutes, so if you do have a question, please do, do send it in uh, quickly, and if we don't get to it, then we'll ask it in the forum. Uh, this is a question we had in advance, and this is from Tom at Skinny Brands, UK, and he asks, what is the most common mistake made by new companies in the export market? Uh, Richard, do you, do you want to have a go at that? Um, 
I think I alluded to it in, in the presentation really, you know, don't underplay it. It's it's not an easy market, you know. Don't think you can just export your, your product or your goods and services. You've really got to resource it uh, very, very well indeed and do your research and don't be afraid to ask, you know. The local chamber for us as an example is it's like a God's gift, you know, if we've got any queries at all we, we can pick up the phone or go online with them and they're extremely helpful. But don't underplay the size of the challenge because it's not it's not easy. It's easier for us now because we've got the experience, but it's not easy, particularly with uh, some of the trade barriers in certain regions and countries. Thank you. Um, we had a question in just about certificates of origin. Uh, the person asking said that they've been told by their forwarder Freight forwarder that they will do the certificate of origin on their behalf, but they're always told as an exporter that they should prepare all of their export documentation as they are responsible for shipment. Is that correct, or can you sometimes get can a distributor adequately do your kind of paperwork for you? Uh, Lorraine, what do you have to say to that? Um, yes, the forwarder can prepare your paperwork for you, but they are going to be preparing that paperwork based on probably the invoice that you've given them. Um, so you probably won't be checking that the certificate of origin is correct. They um, they will just send it to the chamber, get it certified, and send that along with the rest of the paperwork with the shipment. So they can prepare it for you. It's just how much trust you have in your forwarder. Is it a good forwarder that you're dealing with? There are a lot of good forwarders. Um, I would always recommend getting advice from other people with regards to who is a good forwarder. Um, but yes, they can prepare it for you. Is this something you, you ever do, um, Richard, at, at Ramsden? We tend to uh, we tend to write the certificate of origin ourselves. Um, as far as I know, freight forwarders don't do it on our behalf. No, no definitely not. We, we 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 like to make sure we've got it all in house and everything's complying. Okay, and we've um. I think that's probably all we've got time for in terms of questions. Um, so yeah, on that note, I think it's probably time for us to wrap up. Thank you once again to Richard Lorraine and Ian at the end there for the presentation and the answers. Um, I think you've all really highlighted the need to think about doing documentation in an organized and thought through way. So I hope everyone has found that useful. Thanks. Thank you. Cool. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that we will be posting these questions onto our forum in the aftermath to this webinar, so please do keep your eyes peeled for these and let us know if you'd like to withdraw your question in the process. And by all means, please do ask questions on the forum. This was actually the last new bit of content from this year's Food and Drink Feature Month. We've got loads of great guides and articles on the site now, including the FDF and FDEA's Five Step to Export Success Guide, the FDF's Half Year Stats, the FDEA's Promotion for Seattle 2016, which I'm sure will be quite a trade show, and the FDF Manifesto for a New UK-EU Relationship Following Brexit. Please have a look at the site for these, and you'll also find links to our pricing webinar from earlier this week, as well as multiple case studies of food and drink businesses already out there doing international trade. Thank you once again to the Food and Drink Federation and the Food and Drink Exporters Association for their support with this feature this year. Finally, we will soon be, soon be announcing our next webinar with the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council on the 22nd of November. We'll be looking into some of the markets beyond Europe for UK businesses to tap into following Brexit. So that I'm sure will be a, a very interesting session. That's all from us for now. Please take our survey as you exit to let us know what you thought of the webinar and give us suggestions for improvements or future topics. Thank you and see you next month.